week's nice follow-on, hopefully, from uh, our one last time. And this is about uh, uh, maximizing the impact of pharmaceutical applications using both open fax data and, and other linked data. So if you just to update on if you need to get in contact with us about either this, uh, this webinar or other comms events, uh, we're also on Twitter and we have a LinkedIn group and, and you can also subscribe to our newsletter which is available from the openfacts.org website and that the newsletter normally comes out about once every couple of months uh, and particularly has features around uh, data updates and, and other things of interest and related to, to open facts and we, we certainly welcome uh, your input into the content uh, as well if you would like to write articles. So it gives me great pleasure today to uh, welcome uh, as our speaker David Wilde. Uh, David Wilde has a number of roles uh, at the moment. He's both the CEO of uh, Data to Discovery, a, a startup informatics company, uh, and also a uh, associate professor at Indiana University in the in the area of informatics. Uh, David has a, a long background in informatics within the pharma research and drug discovery world, having done his uh, PhD, I think, at Sheffield with, with Peter Willett, and then has had a number of, of both academic and other uh, connections with uh, startups during this time. Uh, so uh, David will also be joined by some of his colleagues uh, to help answer any questions that you might have uh, today on, uh, on, on, this, on this topic. Uh, so let me welcome David to our webinar series, and I'll just hand over to him by and make him presenter. Over to you, David. Great. Thank you very much, Nick, for giving us the opportunity to talk today. I'm just going to switch on my screen here. Hopefully everybody gets to see it. Nick, does that show on your screen? Yep, that, that's perfect. Great. Okay, so um, today I wanted to talk about work that we've been doing primarily in the company, Data to Discovery, um, with an aim to, to maximize the impact of uh, the open facts data in partnership with uh, pharmaceutical companies um, in particular, but also with, in, in association with other organizations. Um, so what I'd like to do today is just introduce the company Data to Discovery and also say just very briefly a little bit about what we've been doing more widely related to open facts um, and then just give it just very briefly a couple of short kind of case studies really of how we've been using the open facts data in, in different contexts and some of the, the vision that we have for where where that can go and what we're implementing with partners um, in the company. Uh, so as Nick said, I kind of have two roles. I'm CEO of, of the start of Data Discovery and also Associate Professor and Director of Data Science at Indiana University. Um, the strongest connection with Open Facts has been that we, um, back in kind of about the 2007-2008 timeframe, we developed um, some of the very early demonstrations of large-scale semantic linked data in drug discovery. We produced something called Kentobio to RDF, uh, which showed that we could we could map together lots of diverse data sets from PubChem through Uniprot through to um, side effect data sets and so on. And then we proceeded in a research group to de develop uh, graph-based in particular algorithms which could sit on top of the semantic link data. Uh, probably the one that we're most well known for is a algorithm called SLAP which um, did uh, drug target association predicting prediction based on the what we call evidence paths between compounds and targets in the semantic link data. Um, so we've been based in the US, we were never formally kind of part of Open Facts except as um, affiliate members, um, but we're heavily involved with the community from the inception and um, you know we're really keen to see the work that's been done in Open Facts have greater impact. Um, in particular, you know, for instance, we're working closely with the NIH National Center for Advancing Translational Sciences that over here that has a good deal of resources um, and we can, you know, we're interested in the partnerships, for instance, that can come between, um, you know, people over here and, and people, people on the other side of the pond. Um, so 
So just to briefly introduce Data to Discovery, we a company that's all about finding insights across uh, data sets that are traditionally siloed and maybe people have never even thought about drawing together. Um, so we're in particular able to bring together proprietary public and commercial data um, in some pretty interesting ways. Um, our focus is healthcare and pharmaceutical research and we have real interest in linking data right the way from molecular through to human. So in particular being able to map together clinical data and, and data out there in the field about patients um, with data that's from a more molecular research preclinical um, domain. Um, we've got a lot of expertise in the company in using open facts data. We um, have, have you know, long-standing history working with the molecular data, so we're able to to understand the a lot of the um, you know under the HUD stuff, both in how it's represented semantically and also the domain expertise in chemistry and biology and cheminformatics and so on. Um, so right now, what we're doing is we're partnering with customers to implement um, <coughs> this um, ways of, of integrating and, and using integrated data uh, in new ways at scale. And we have a kind of beachhead application in phenotypic drug discovery, and I'll explain why that is in a little bit. Our website's d2discovery.com. So just to kind of emphasize that our kind of home is really in the preclinical world, but we're actually very active um, across different domains, and we see a lot of opportunity in, in linking data across domains. So our, our kind of our bread and butter is pharmaceutical research, um, where we, we're kind of bridging into the clinical, particularly in areas like real-world evidence and adverse event prediction. We're also working with customers in healthcare delivery. Uh, these these would be um, healthcare providers and insurance companies um, on things like performance-based pricing, risk adjustment, combination therapies. And then also we're starting to work in, in public health. We're kind of earlier there, but um, you know, things like uh, quantified self data and, and kind of nudge economics. And these all kind of come together in population health. So we're at the very early stage of some of this work, but we see a huge amount of opportunity there. So one thing we're doing with with the partners that we have is really reimagining what an IT infrastructure looks like in a in a linked data world where we don't obey the laws of where data gets used and where it doesn't data doesn't get used, but we open up the possibility of all data being used in all places where it's relevant. Uh, so we're helping companies move away from a kind of siloed model where uh, this is based on, on you know, Oracle SQL databases and where there's really just point-wise connections between data coming from different domains into a linked data world. Uh, where we can rapidly pull together the right piece of data to answer the questions that we need to answer. Um, so the way we think of this infrastructure now is in three three levels. The first is a linked data ecosystem, and this um, this is really the linking together of data. But this includes various components uh, such as data APIs, uh, data translators. Uh, live triple stores, and of course ontologies and standards that can be used to bring the data together. Um, then sitting on top of that linked data ecosystem is a computation infrastructure where we can do high speed um, in memory computation that works on data subgraphs. And I think this is something quite new that uh, rather than working on all the data all the time, we say, okay, what's, what problem are we trying to solve here? And what data subgraph can we spin off to get the right data together from the ecosystem to solve it? And then we do very scalable computation using cloud computing and Spark and so on um, to be able to do computations on these subgraphs. And then interaction infrastructure where actually spinning off, doing agile spinning off of applications to solve very specific problems. So we're not trying to be a generic tool provider, but we're, we kind of go in a very agile fashion and solve very specific problems that require data from different domains and across different areas uh, to solve them. So 
So I'm going to give a couple of examples of work that we're doing. Um, both one is on the linked data ecosystem side, and the other is on the kind of computation and interaction side. So the first case study is with Eli Lilly. Um, uh, Eli Lilly, and in particular Derek Maron, who's uh, leads the, as I'm sure many of you know, leads the research. Um, IT and is a very strong supporter of open facts um, has also been a very strong supporter of, of partnering to, to demonstrate what, what can come next. Um, and with Eli Lilly, we've um, really been working on this linked data ecosystem. Um, one of the key things we've done is to develop a live data translator that maps the key internal Lilly assay data into literally into an Apple Facts triple store. So we're taking a, a open link triple store uh, that contains the current open facts uh, data. We're mapping the data in the internal data into the same ontologies as open facts and same ontology space. So this for instance means using things like the bioassay ontology. Um, and then uh, we put we literally putting it all, feeding it all live into the same triple store. Um, this means we can then um, basically search for data without it mattering at all, whether that data is, is public data or, or internal data. So for instance, we can say, find me all the compounds that show act, um, agonist activity against this target, and it'll pull back seamlessly data from both the um, the internal data and the, the open facts data. So we think this is a big enabler um, and we're just starting to see what, what the data translator can enable when, when you have that level of, of type mapping between the internal and external. Now, not everything is easy, of course, and there's a lot of kind of decisions and grunt work have to be done in this process in, um, you know, how it's not often clear how you know long-standing internal ways to represent things map the external world, but I think we've demonstrated that it's, it's doable, and um, you, you know you can you can get high impact by doing it. We're interested in not just stopping at searching, but enabling um, tools and uh, solutions to to specific problems um, that use that capability to across over the data sources. So uh, now with, with Eli Lilly, we're looking at um, high impact end user applications across the organization um, in, different, in different domains. So this gets to kind of the second case study that I'll talk about, which we, is more general than working with Eli Lilly, but um, it's one of the areas we can look at. I've also had very strong support from the Open Innovation in Drug Discovery uh, group at Eli Lilly, um, which has really pioneered the development of, of um, open phenotypic assays, where phenotypic assays um, explicitly dis described, and we, we're now able to kind of meet the rewards of that connection to what we're doing with Lilly. So this is just a kind of schematic of um, of what we're doing with Lily. So, so the on the top left-hand corner is the data that we're, we're mapping into the triple store from the internal data source at Lily. So this is data about targets, really assay, primarily assay result information. So information about assays, targets, result types, and assay methodology. And then we can map those um, to things like um, uh, the targets to Unipod genes, we could map um, uh, via cell lines, for instance, to Kemble cell lines, um, and we could map by the bioassay ontology to map the uh, different assay methodologies together. Uh, so for us, this is a really nice kind of demonstration of how it can all come together within an organization. So the second uh, case study I want to talk about um, is uh, is in the actual taking integrated data and solving problems with it. And this is in phenotypic drug discovery. Um, this is kind of a beachhead application that we're, de we're developing. Um, for, and we chose phenotypic drug discovery for several kind of interlocking reasons. Uh, the first was that it's the subject of strong farmer interest. So we're participants in the Open Facts Researchathon in spring 2015, where there was there's really a huge amount of 
need to be able to um, have tools to help um, analyze uh, phenotypic assay data, particularly to be able to take phenotypic results and map them back into the molecular world of targets and pathways and so on. Um, and in that meeting, we actually identified specific high, high priority use cases. Um, and secondly, is because it, it really crosses the two big two domains, the domain of the chemistry and biology, the molecular side, the preclinical side, and what's really the study of people, patient side, the clinical, um, and so on. So we, we, we like to have a B-trade application that really spans from the molecular through to the clinical, and phenotypic drug discovery and phenotypic assays are right on that borderline. Um, and the third reason was that to, to do this, you really need to bring together many data sets that cross both the preclinical and, and clinical. So, um, <clears throat> so it's really a natural application for semantic it, linking, link data. So um, what we have now, now is a product in development called P3. It's not a finished product, we're not a vendor selling it, it's a product in development. But right now it's a, really a demonstration of uh, capability and, and proof of concept. Um, but it's designed to address current gaps in maximizing the impact of farms, phenotypic assay data. And the key applications which were derived from that um, uh, Santiago de Compostela meeting are target deconvolution but the top big top two are target deconvolution and target based mechanism of action discovery. So the first one is um, can we use um, phenotypic data to give us insights as to target involvement in specific phenotypic assays. Um, and the second is saying okay we have this compound is giving a positive readout in this phenotypic assay and <clears throat> can we understand something about the mechanism of action, the target-based mechanism of action of why this might be giving a positive readout. Um, and there's a bunch of others. So one important one is identifying similarities between phenotypic assays. So there's a bunch of other kind of potential use cases we can uh, we can uh, implement that we're looking at as kind of tertiary priorities. Um, so what P3 does is it brings together the open facts data and then optionally with other data sources that can be commercial or proprietary um, and identifies associations using something called SEMAP which we developed in the company derived from the SLAP algorithm that I mentioned for association finding that we developed at IU. And what it does right now is it can link open facts data into other key data resources specifically for this uh, phenotypic um, problem. Uh, so P3, we're building a highly scalable componentized architecture so we can, uh, it's perhaps a little ambitious so we can plug and play data sets because it's more plug and play, there's always semantic mapping that has to be done, won't work, but the architecture is there to plug and play data sets. Uh, and, and that allows new applications to be quickly developed with using different data sets. It's highly scalable. We use Spark on cloud, uh, Amazon AWS cloud platform, <coughs> um, and it can be securely deployed where needed. So we can literally package up Docker images and deploy it behind firewalls where needed, as well as being available as a software as a service. So P3 can link public and proprietary data sources and cross preclinical and clinical data. So some examples of data we can use are uh, enzymatic assay data, phenotypic assay of course, cellular assay, gene expression data, pathway, and then a whole bunch of what we call molecular phenotype links. So um, mapping things, for instance, compounds, genes, pathways, and cell lines to things like disease states, genotypes, patient phenotypes, adverse events, even electronic medical records and real-world evidence. Much of that is still yet to be done, but we have the kind of um, architecture to enable that to be done. Um, so I'm not going to go into detail into the SEMAP algorithm, but it predicts association between any two nodes in the network based on the sub data subnetworks and statistically significant what we call evidence paths going through the semantic link data between points of interest. It's been shown it can, for instance, predict drug target interaction across 
thousands of genes. So, for instance, you can find associations that go from a compound to every human target. Um, we've done a, a bunch of validations of it in the drug target application. Um, and <clears throat> there's a uh, reference there to the PLOS computational biology paper that describes that. Um, <clears throat> so, um, we're now at a point where we kind of can demonstrate publicly P3 uh, uh, various ways. Um, and this is really nice um, example of, um, you know, bringing together work with open facts um, with this the P3 is actually now supported by an SBIR grant from the National Science Foundation. And key um, partner has also been the NIH, which is um, through the National Center for Advancing Translational Sciences, or NCAT. Um, we've partnered with them to actually make um, a freely available resource of phenotypic data, which we've been able to, to draw into this right now. So it's a really nice partnership between um, OpenFact, NSF, and NIH. Uh, and um, so right now, this we just have. I'm going to show you a very small demonstration that links together uh, the um, OpenFact's Kemble with um, this NCATS phenotypic drug discovery resource, which I'll describe briefly in a second, um, and some uh, gene annotations. And we're now actually working with NCATS on an application that goes beyond that into uh, repurposing for tuberculosis. Uh, so I do want to give a shout out to the Phenotypic Drug Discovery Resource. This was a collaboration between Eli Lilly, Open Innovation in Drug Discovery, and NIH NCATS. A really kind of exciting um, <coughs> project where um, NCATS provided uh, physical samples of about two and a half thousand marketed drugs, and Eli Lilly pr provided uh, just over 30 uh, phenotypic assays that had been publicly described as part of their open innovation project. Um, and they screened those two and a half thousand drugs in these uh, 30 or so phenotypic assays and committed to make the results completely public and open. Uh, so we worked with NCATS to actually make them available in uh, reusable, harvestable semantic form maps to the, to the outside world of data. So you can actually go to the, um, to the website. Uh, if you just go to the, actually go to the uh, NCATS website, you can navigate to it from there. And <clears throat> um, it's called the Phenotypic Drug Discovery Resource, and it's all uh, downloadable. So this is really a, a kind of unprecedented phenotypic resource that we're going to. It's going to be built on. There's going to be more data going into it. And I think has a huge um, potential application um, in, in in fueling research. Um, so um, I'm going to just going to jump straight to a kind of little example here. This isn't meant to be a kind of big wow example. This is just meant to demonstrate one one piece, right? So this is a version of P3 that simply brings together the OpenFax triple store together with this open phenotypic drug discovery data that we um, was published on the NCATS website. And apologies if this is kind of small, I'll try and make it a little bigger. So what we're seeing here is we're looking at one particular phenotypic assay. So this ID 11173480 um, is one of the phenotypic assays from Eli Lilly that was used in this project. And here connected, what we've done here is the question we're asking right now is um, what, what could be strongly associated um, protein targets to this phenotypic assay via the information we know about which compounds are active in the assays. So what we're doing here is we're taking links between phenotypic assays and compounds that come from the phenotypic drug discovery resource. So here we see some of the compounds that are active um, in this phenotypic assay. But then we're taking links between the compounds and protein targets that come from Kemble. Right? So we're linking these together and we can then use the SEMAP algorithm to find the most strongly associated um, protein targets this assay. So what we actually see here are the top 10 most strongly associated protein targets using the SEMAP algorithm and the, and the drugs or compounds that connect them. 
So we can actually use this in an exploratory fashion to look for connections by these drugs between the assay and the, uh, and the, the target. Or we can kind of take a, a spreadsheet um, kind of view. So here we can actually see the, if you look down halfway down with this, uh, sorry, the top where it says protein, these are the top 10 most strongly associated proteins to the to that phenotypic assay. And all this can be done back end and be exportable. It doesn't have to be done through an interface. Um, so one um, thing I want to point out as well is that all this is sitting live on top of a Sparkle query on, on the triple store. So uh, we actually have a Sparkle query that sucks out this data subgraph from the much bigger triple store. And then uh, this is the data subgraph we're working on in this particular application. Um, so all of this can be changed live so we can pull off different data subgraphs and do diff different things with them. So that's just one very simple example, one example of one use case with P3. Uh, if we can just go back to the PowerPoint here. Um, what we're um, actually working on now is a project again supported by NIH NCAT to look at can we actually use the phenotypic drug discovery resource data together with open facts data and together with some other TB data to look for drug repurposing opportunities for, for tuberculosis. So what we're actually in the middle of right now is we're um, adding new entities into a version of P3 specifically for TB um, that include the definition of tuberculosis as a disease node. Then we have links from tuberculosis to MTB targets um, that are actually uh, parasitic targets, not human targets. And then links between compounds and drugs and MTB targets. Um, and also between the compounds and tuberculosis as a disease node that come from both Kemble and drug bank. And the question we ask is, can we identify potential new MTB drugs by scoring paths through all of the linked data? So can we, you know, literally bring together all the pieces of the puzzle and see if we can find uh, potential new MTB drugs? We have as part of this project an opportunity to follow up with some expert review wet lab testing which will be pursued. But right now we're at a stage on the right hand side, you can see for instance we can we're pulling back <coughs> um, proteins, assays and compounds that are strongly associated with tuberculosis disease node right now. So we could we know at the point where we can present exciting results for a new T B drug right now, but this is um, this is quite an exciting project, I think. Uh, so the P three um, is something that we're taking out taking this approach of, of crossing these lines between preclinical and uh, development and clinical and post-market healthcare. We're looking at applications that solve problems, um, high impact problem, problems across the pharmaceutical um, organization. So for instance, we're um, working with um, real world evidence data um, and actually working on the uh, connections between you know, post-market data, um, data in healthcare providers, and preclinical data. Uh, for instance, so we can push back information into preclinical that comes right the way from downstream. So this is all, all in progress. It's not, we don't have finished products here yet, but uh, this is a kind of direction that we're going. So I just want to kind of finish up and, you know, say what, you know, what can we offer? We're really interested in partnering with more organizations. We've built really great relationships with Eli Lilly and a small number of other farmers, um, and also with NIH and CATS, um, and um, some actually uh, you know, healthcare providers and so on. Um, but I, I think the key things that we're really excited to partner with people on are firstly agile development of high impact applications that use semantic linked data and in particular you know, maximize the use of open facts. You know, a lot of companies are now ingesting open facts data into their organizations and uh, you know doing some able to do you know searching applications on it. But we want to kind of, um, help companies take the next step to really maximize the use of all the data in open facts together with other semantic linked data sources both internally in the organization and externally, um, including commercial partners and freely publicly available data. 
um, to really solve problems that are really going to impact the organization. So phenotyping drug discovery is one, also working with toxicology, uh, adverse event, real-world evidence, and so on. Um, we, we can help companies uh, build a linked data ecosystem, build data translators to map uh, internal data into um, open facts compatible space and build uh, these computation uh, infrastructure and user components that are not just one tool fits all but uh, are actually can be tuned and even tuned live by changing Sparkle queries to solve different problems. And of course, we have the background in using open facts data, so uh, we're able to understand the domain well. So, uh, we, you know, we'd love to be um, seeing more of these activities going on. So, so we'd love to kind of hear from people who are, who are interested in taking the next step with open facts. I think at that point we can uh, maybe hand it back to Nick and um, and take questions. Great. Thank, thanks, David, very, very much for that uh, very clear uh, summary of, of what you've been doing over this past period with, with Open Facts. Uh, I should have said this right at the beginning, but just to, uh, whilst people think of questions, and I, I've probably got some as well, that there are two ways you can ask questions in, in, in the GoToWebinar. Uh, you can either raise your hand, uh, and we'll, we'll try and put you on to uh, live mic, if, if that helps or you can actually write your questions in the questions panel uh, as well. Uh, there should be a questions panel in your the little app that's running uh, GoToMeeting. So you can either type it in, or uh, we can also try and uh, open up the mic uh, in, as well if you want to talk, uh, to speak the, speak the question. Maybe let me go first with a, couple, uh, with a question so that uh, you, you mentioned a little bit about the bow mapping at the beginning, David. Uh, did you were there any particular challenges with the, the bow mapping in terms of trying to, to reach across the broadness of bow? Did you try and did you have to come up with perhaps a, a simpler set of, of which bits of bow you wanted to use? Yeah, I think the general principle we had to take was um, not trying to bite off everything all at once. Um, so we started with really simple. Um, uh, kind of the simplest kind of data that we can consider mapping um, between um, proprietary and public and then kind of extend that from there and I think based on you know um, individual companies kind of ways of doing things you know one example of things we hit were overloaded terms where you know maybe there's a, a field in um, internal data which is used for for two purposes depending on the type of assay where and you've got to find a way to try and map that into effectively one um, one type in in bow um, maybe I can just throw that question to to Jeremy Yang who's actually has implemented a lot of this Jeremy did you want to comment on that uh, sure I hope everyone can hear me uh, BOW, as uh, many will know, is uh, originated at uh, University of Miami um, and with PI Stefan Schurer. And as David said, uh, our uh, plan was to use some of the uh, highest kind of classifiers in the hierarchy, for example, cell-based assay, uh, to annotate and classify assays uh, not to be as comprehensive as possible. and uh, as with other things, uh, be kind of use case oriented. So, uh, yeah, it was a first step, and uh, this was done for the OPDDR uh, assay set. Um, and in part, it's again a proof of concept that uh, this important resource can be linked in and used to uh, do cross domain semantic queries. Okay, uh, th thanks for that. Uh, whilst we uh, see if anyone, just uh, looking to see if anyone's raised their hand. So by, by all means, if you, if you want to type a question, uh, do so, or, or just raise your hand in the, uh, uh, in the app. Uh, we can then uh, come, come to you. Maybe just a, a, a follow-on question. You, you had that nice picture. I think it was sort of three quarters through just before the demo, David, when, when you were describing the, the sort of the, the, the linked data connections that you were trying to pull out with your uh, your reasoning engine. W was there any particular challenges there that you found? 
in, in running that association work? Yes, that one. Yeah. Yes, that's right. So this, so what you see here, I didn't really talk about this, but these are just some of the mappings um, that that we're using in in the network of the current cap demonstration of P3. So we can maybe use this just to highlight a couple of things. One is um, you see the link between phenotypic assay and, and pathway, right? So you can see the link is called EIEIO. And um, I forget what we, we kind of, we made that into a real acronym for something, but we hit so hit issues of saying, you know, what is the relationship between the phenotypic assay and pathway? Well, there's not really a great ontology for that right now, so we have to kind of make things up on the fly to make it work, and but be prepared to kind of backtrack later if we need to. So I think one lesson we've learned is that you have to, you have to make on, there's two options. You either make on-the-fly decisions about how to map things and be prepared to go back and change it, or you just get stuck. Um, so we've taken the route of not getting stuck. <clears throat> um, so I think that's one thing. Another is that the, um, you know, this what we call the kind of last mile kind of problem, where, you know, for instance, a, a um, you know, what is a pathway, right, or what is a gene? Sounds like obvious, it's like, that's not a problem. But actually the, you know, what what gene ontology considers a pathway is kind of subtly different from what Reactome considers a pathway. And then you start to drill down to, well, well what really is a pathway? Like, <laughs> and the, the, if, again, it's the kind of situation where you have to make some on-the-fly decisions, as in we're going to consider it to be like this. Um, but you know, the um, you have to constantly make sure that those decisions are not leading you down a path that you don't want to go down. Maybe Randy can just say a couple of words. Again, he's the one who's who's doing this work on the mapping. Uh, Randy Kerber. Randy, are you there? Yeah. There yes. Having having struggles trying to unmute. Um, so, so yeah, Nick, I mean, if you have a particular aspect of this you're curious about, um, so I guess some of the challenges would be, you know, just trying to, you know, like we're trying to do here is simplify, having a more logically simplified graph, um, so we're dealing with high-level concepts like compound and protein underneath inside PubChem and Kemble. It's a very complex network. Um, and we're working with the RDF version, uh, so we're trying to uh, you know, kind of take a still a complex network underneath into a fairly high level graph, such as you're seeing here. Um, the EIEIO link is just kind of a variable name. I forget. I kind of created it to simplify the graph. It's something like expert inferred um, influencer of, and that's information we got from. Um, forget the name of the name of the guy. Uh, but this was adding sort of extra annotations we're adding to the assays to uh, to link it up with the other parts of the network. Um, and yeah, David, that, what well, other that, aspect? Oh, go ahead. No, I was just saying that that makes perfect sense. And, and maybe just as a, I, I, there's a couple of questions coming as well. And, and Derek uh, has asked about what was the biggest learning on the mapping of the data. I don't know if that follows on from from what both of you were just describing. Or. Yeah, I guess the biggest learning is there's, um, yeah, I mean, there's something out there called the linked open data cloud, and you know, looking at that, it says, okay, everything's linked together. It's ready to query across. Um, in practice, there's sort of being physically linked is not the same as being semantically linked. Um, there's a lot of work to figure out how things are actually connected. Um, it's difficult documentation, uh, so there's a lot of you know, what I probably call semantic integration or a lot of unlocking of you know how to make sense of all the stuff out there when there in general is not really good guides on how do these different public data sets fit together, what's actually in them, you know, what's in this version, and how do you really link across them and combine them. And that's the kind of, you know, so that's kind of the objective of open facts, and that's what we're trying to do here is kind of take this all to the next step. So you have 
okay, there's all these disparate data sets underneath, but on top of it, there's a more simplified conceptual view, such as, you know, this, this, this kind of graph. And we're expanding this graph as we go along. Um, and it's like right now, we're expanding to disease and probably looking at cell lines soon. Okay. Uh, since on, on, on that point about cell lines, uh, APIC asks a question about can you explain how you integrate tissue-based gene expression data? So, um, so that, I mean, just as a general way that we integrate data, what we can do is we can integrate any data source in via kind of data set data sets that express relationships, um, or by kind of work, effectively working with experts to manually annotate links between things, right? So example, the EIEIO example here is a, actually sitting down with somebody who understood these phenotypic assays and saying, okay, is this, is this path, which pathways are strongly connected to this phenotypic assay? And some are obvious like one to and some are not so obvious. So I think with expression, tissue-based expression data, there's, again, it's a, there's, a, there's an integration process, right, which involves, well, what, what links to tissue-based expression data? Well, the tissue can link to an organ, it can link to a disease, it can link to uh, patient phenotype groups, it could be an animal one linking to other things. So there's a bunch of, of links that can come from the, uh, the tissue itself. And then there's a bunch of links that can come from the um, the expression data, right? So there's um, the actual experimental data of over and under expression, and then compound links where um, where uh, samples treated with particular compounds have particular uh, expression profiles. So so in terms of linking the data in, it's a matter of the imagination of what what we think is important to link those in, and that differs according to the experiment and the source and so on. Um, but then there's the application of how you can use it. So for instance, we can we can kind of profile, you can embed that data in something else you're doing. So you can embed the, um, the gene expression data in solving the problem of, of um, you know, looking for target associations to a phenotypic assay, um, and also in, to, in mechanism of action discovery, so you can then, if you do that mapping well, you can then start to see the links between um, between a compound and a phenotypic assay via the the expression data, for instance. So, so in a sense, something like expression data isn't any different to anything else, but there's going to be, when we, particularly when we're dealing with these kind of things on the borderline of, of clinical and preclinical, there's, there's a bunch of, of experimental data that you can map in, and there's a bunch of more kind of, you know, maybe amorphous connections that can come from working with people who understand why those, those experiments were created in the first place and what problems they're trying to solve and so on. I know that was a bit of a long-winded answer, but maybe that was helpful. Oh, thanks for that. And in a way, I think you might have uh, uh, partly answered Ian's question. He's asked about the how much expert curation is required for successful mapping and how well does this semantic mapping scale. So, uh, yeah. So actually, Jeremy was just noting there, which I've got to say, which was we, you know, we did on the public side. We have integrated the human proteome atlas. So that's one um, example of a data set we've integrated in. In terms of the amount of human curation, um, it's I would say that it's more than I expected. Right. So I think. I think we've found that we've had to go back to people more than more than I thought we'd have to to resolve um, kind of nitty gritty kind of questions um, about how one thing might map to another. Um, but but in the end, it depends on your appetite for a ninety percent solution versus a hundred percent solution. Um, so you know where there's where there's a kind of a gap, you can either decide to to find find human ways to 
to bridge that gap, or you can you can just decide not to not to fill that gap and to to take some other route. Um, so um, so I, I would say in general, this the the effort of integration is non-trivial, even when you're basing on top of the fantastic work that's been done in open facts already, you still, when you're taking out from that into other data sets, you still have that same process of having to resolve these entity um, equivalence um, problems and, um, and subtle differences in, in kind of mapping and gaps gaps in current data and so on. So it's it's work. <laughs> but I think it's I think it's work that can really be huge rewards if you if you're prepared to do it. Okay, thanks. Uh, whilst just just so that we can make the most of the time, whilst people are perhaps thinking of any final questions, I'll just jump back to explain a little bit about uh, what's happening next with our webinar series. Uh, since we've got about uh, five minutes left today. Uh, and then if there's any final questions that uh, uh, people would like to ask, we'll, we'll, we'll cover them uh, you know, in the next five minutes or so, uh, if that's okay. Uh, so just as a recap on our, our next uh, session, we're, we're now approaching a bit of the summer series, summer season uh, with, with respect to everyone in different regions. So what we've decided to do is our next Okay, so I think we've lost Nick. Maybe I could just take any more questions directly, or uh, Kira, maybe you could uh, manage that. I'm sure we can um, finish up here if there are no more questions. And um, I suppose we'll send out an email to our newsletter list, and you'll be able to see tweets and on our website about the upcoming webinars and more details about what's going to be in there. Okay, well, um, I'd like to thank David and everyone else for coming to this webinar today, and. I hope it's be interesting and we hope to see you at the next one. Great. And many thanks to everybody for joining and um, to uh, Kira and Nick for, for facilitating this. Uh, thank you.